Greetings guys, the Comics Kid 2099 here, and it's Monday, so it's time for me to talk to you about an X-Men graphic novel that I recently read, X-Men, uh, The Day After. This is uh, some of the aftermath from the House of M event that Marvel did around the mid-2000s. Uh, it was called Decimation, and unlike House of M, which... While it was not a good story by any means, in fact it was a horrible story, uh, unlike that, it was at least a story. Decimation really isn't a story. It's just, uh, it's got this big banner going across all these events, uh, you'll see it right there, uh, and it's on several of the covers of these books that are part of the Decimation event, event but, uh, it's not a story, it's just characters reacting to the story of House of M. In fact, uh, this book collects Decimation colon House of M dash the day after, and that's just an oversized one-shot that basically has every X-Men character reacting to House of M, and really nothing happens in that event, or in that little one-shot, other than characters saying, oh, okay, this is what I think of House of M. And I guess it's sort of supposed to be a backdoor pilot for all of the X-Men books and kind of showing what changes they would all be going through, because it does kind of seed a lot of stuff that would be going on later on after House of M. For example, there's one page that shows uh, Pete Wisdom is being briefed on his new mission. He has to go find Captain Britain, okay? Uh, that sounds good, I guess. Uh, I haven't read any of the Excalibur or new Excalibur stuff from around this time period, so I'm assuming this was just kind of updating people, saying, okay, in a post-House of M world, this is what your Excalibur comics are going to look like. And so, it was never really a story, it was more an extended commercial uh, was the best thing that I can say about that one shot. And then also this collects issues 177 through 181 of the Adjectiveless X-Men series. And that's why I'm reviewing this book because I've been reviewing Peter Milligan's run on Adjectiveless X-Men. And uh, this collects two uh, short storylines. Uh, the first one, uh, nothing happens except that uh, Valerie Cooper, who is a government agent, sometimes enemy, sometimes ally of the X-Men, uh, she comes to the X-Men with uh, three giant sentinels and says guess what we are going to live here now and it's a really terribly written uh, storyline because uh, Val Cooper just sends the uh, Sentinels to the X-Men's front door and the X-Men are like, uh, it's Sentinels, we need to attack because Sentinels have always been enemies of the X-Men and anytime the X-Men see Sentinels, they're trying to kill mutants and so Val Cooper seems to think that it's a good idea to just send these Sentinels to the X-Men and the Sentinels keep saying, we're not here to attack but if you were one of the X-Men, would you believe the Sentinels? Uh, I wouldn't. And then finally, Val Cooper says, if I had called, what would you have said? And Cyclops is like, you didn't call. Uh, that's what makes this situation so untenable. Uh, you did not call. You just sent these guys here, and now you claim that you live here. And uh, this was a development that I never liked when I was reading X-Men comics back then, uh, because after this point where the Sentinels basically become uh, the chaperones to the X-Men, it became that much harder for every writer to write stories. Because anytime you want to have the X-Men leave the mansion and go have an adventure, you have to ride around the fact that there are these huge Sentinel Guardians guarding the mansion. And usually you have to find some way to make the O-N-E, that's these guys who are guarding uh, the X-Men, you have to find some way to make them look incompetent so that the X-Men can escape and go have some adventure outside of their home. And I always thought that was a really dumb development anyway, and I'm sure I'm not the only one because it wasn't too much longer after this that Messiah Complex happened, and they basically just got rid of this whole idea of the Sentinels guarding the X-Men. And while I really don't like the direction that the X-Men books have taken since House of M, for the most part, I don't like a lot of the X-Men books that uh, have happened since House of M, I do like the idea that the X-Men finally just said, you know what, we're sick of this, we're all just going to move, and you're not going to follow us. Uh, I really like that, because I hated the idea of Sentinel Guardians. So basically, in that first storyline, uh, Sentinels come to live here, and that's about it. Uh, and then uh, Polaris, she decides, I'm going to leave. I don't have my powers anymore, I'm completely useless. And... This was really weird because Cyclops and Havoc are both saying, you're always welcome here. Even if you don't have your powers, you should still stay here. What's really weird about this is that 
In this very book, they mention that Emma Frost fired Danny Moonstar because she no longer had her powers. Emma Frost is basically one of the members of this team. She is basically a recurring character in this particular title. And it's really weird that in another title, she fires one of the staff members, and she's the one behind this idea of, let's get rid of all these students who don't have their powers anymore. She's behind that idea, and yet here, Cyclops is saying, if you don't have your powers, that's okay, you can still stay here. Uh, that's really inconsistent, and of course, Emma Frost is still saying, well, if she does stay here, she's useless to us, and she says that out loud. Uh, so I guess it's not inconsistent with her character, but it's really weird that Cyclops would let firing Danny Moonstar slide, but then he wouldn't say anything uh, to Lorna or Polaris. It's really weird that he lets her, or he offers her the chance to stay, but he doesn't say anything to Moonstar. Uh, that's really strange. Um, but uh, basically, that's all that happens in that little storyline. And then we have another storyline where not a whole lot happens. Uh, Havoc has quit the X-Men, and he's walking around the world with Polaris because he thinks that she needs protection. And while that sounds incredibly sexist, uh, truthfully, uh, Polaris is out of her mind, so she probably does need protection because uh, this weird, gross-looking alien creature uh, falls to the planet, and somehow Polaris knew where it was going to fall. And uh, this is something that she saw in the Golgotha storyline, and she's kind Kind of in the background of each storyline since then, she keeps talking about what she saw in space. And finally, we find out it's this creature that looks a whole lot like Dupe from the Ecstatic series that Peter Milligan wrote. And uh, this is very contradictory with the Dupe miniseries that uh, Peter Milligan wrote years later. Uh, that series says that Dupe is uh, seemingly uh, part of a very strange species that comes from like this alternate reality uh, where he kind of lives between the panels. Uh, that was his origin in the Dupe miniseries. Here we're told that this creature, uh, who Polaris calls Dap, D -A -A -P, and I just assumed it was a different creature and then it wasn't actually Dupe. Uh, here we are told that Dap seemingly comes from outer space. Uh, that was what I assumed. Maybe he came from that other dimension and then he went to outer space and then came to Earth. I don't know why he would do that. In fact, I don't know why Dap does anything that he does in this book. Uh, this is really the transition period from where uh, Peter Milligan's run becomes really stupid stuff where characters act really petty and stupid, but the series is still readable and you can still kind of tell what's going on to... I have no idea what's going on at this point. It kind of transitions to that right around this point, where Polaris, like I said, is insane. And she was insane in Chuck Austin's run, but Chuck Austin handled her as she's insane, but very dangerous to everyone around her. While Peter Milligan handles her as she's insane, but she's more broken. She's not really dangerous to everyone else. And here, she is very, very much in denial. She keeps telling Alex, she says, uh, listen, this creature doesn't mean us any harm. And meanwhile, this creature keeps, like, sending the these force waves towards Alex, knocking him up against trees, and Polaris is like, oh, that silly creature, he doesn't mean us any harm, that was just me, that was my powers coming back. She actually says that. She actually thinks that she is knocking Alex up against these trees, which, if that was true, I don't understand how that would be any better than the creature doing it to him. But uh, finally, uh, this one lady, the Leper Queen, I forgot to mention her, she is part of the Sapien League, and basically her daughter was a mutant, and her daughter had fire powers and accidentally burned up the house and uh, killed herself accidentally, and then the Leper Queen blames all mutants for her daughter being a mutant. And I, if I have anything positive to say about this book at all, I think it's kind of interesting that we have one of these uh, bigot humans who is a woman instead of just some white dude. Uh, the Uncanny X-Cast, which is a podcast that I've listened to a little bit, uh, one of the guys on that podcast mentioned that basically all of the evil humans in the X-Men, they're all just old white dudes, uh, and they all kind of are similar. And so it's nice to see them change things a little bit. Instead of an old white dude, it's a white woman. Uh, so, you know, that was kind of neat, I guess. Uh, but her characterization makes very little sense. Of course, bigotry in general makes very little sense, but her characterization would make a lot more sense if a mutant had killed her kid, uh, which is what we were told at first, but then it's like, no, actually her kid was a mutant, and somehow she thinks that all other mutants should pay because her kid was a mutant. It's almost like she was unhinged before her kid died, and she's just kind of gone further into insanity. I don't know. But anyway, the Leper Queen has somehow followed Alex and Polaris out into the middle of nowhere where this alien falls down, and then she comes out to try and attack them, and then uh, Alex blasts uh, this 
uh, alien creature Daph, instead of, you know, the lady attacking Polaris, he thinks, you know what, I'm going to attack this alien over here. Polaris can take care of herself, even though she doesn't have any powers and that other lady has a knife. And then uh, the creature dissolves into some goo, and then it jumps on the Leper Queen and Polaris, and it brings them both up into the sky. And then Alex must be thinking, wow, I'm the biggest idiot in the entire world. Maybe I should have killed that lady who was attacking Polaris. Uh, but... Like I said, this is where the book kind of transitions into, I have no idea what's going on, and I'm pretty sure Peter Milligan doesn't either. Uh, it will be, a lot of this stuff will be wrapped up in the next storyline, Blood of Apocalypse, which is also Peter Milligan's final storyline. So I'm assuming that Peter Milligan at this point, he knew that he wasn't going to be on the X-Men for much longer, so he was just kind of throwing stuff at the wall to see what would stick. You know, it's not very good. Uh, the good news is uh, it's also not very memorable. So if you're one of those people who you read this series way back when, you probably don't remember anything about this run because it is very easy to just forget everything that happened here. Uh, it's not very good, but it's also not so mind-numbingly bad that you're going to remember it for years and years and years. Uh, and I also forgot to mention, there's another subplot here. Uh, Mystique comes back to the school, and uh, she's got this uh, French thief named Pulse. And uh, she's basically saying, because his powers are what they are, he is a perfect boyfriend for Rogue. And yes, this is continuing uh, the plot threads that were developed in uh, Bizarre Love Triangle. Uh, basically, uh, Mystique doesn't like Gambit. She doesn't think that he's uh, worthy enough to be dating Rogue. So she wants to break them up. And she thinks that the only factor that matters uh, when two people are dating is uh, their powers compatibility. And this guy, Pulse, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this, even though it's not even revealed until uh, the Blood of Apocalypse storyline. But Pulse, his power is basically he can deal power anyone else that he touches. And so he could touch Rogue, and Mystique thinks that because he can touch Rogue, that he is the perfect match for Rogue. Never mind the fact that he might just not like Rogue, or Rogue might not like him. Uh, never mind all that. Mystique is still trying to mess around with Rogue's personal life, and I still think it's stupid that that is a subplot here. Although, it's better that it's a subplot here than a main plot in Bizarre Love Triangle. When it was the A plot, that was when I really hated it. When it just takes up like two and a half pages of this book, it's not as bad. Uh, but overall, what do I think of Decimation uh, or X-Men the day after? It's part of the Decimation storyline. What do I think? I don't like it. I don't think anyone should read this. I found very little redeemable about this. It was very hard for me to read, uh, probably because that oversized one-shot was at the beginning of it, and it was just hard to get through that, but I finally managed to do it. Uh, so I would not recommend anyone read this book, and uh, that's all I have to say about this particular uh, uh, book in Peter Milligan's run on X-Men. And uh, next week I'll be talking about the Blood of Apocalypse miniseries. I don't think there's anything else in Peter Milligan's run. I think it's that book and then that's the last one. And so uh, I'll be talking about that, and then I'm not really sure what I'll be doing next uh, talking about X-Men stuff, but I'll think of something in between now and then. So I'll see you guys in the future. Have a great rest of the day. Catch you later.